you can have an influence, a negative influence on our security, even if you're not a NATO ally. And we did not act appropriately early. I think we should have had more American forces in Ukraine, not to fight the Russians, but to train with the Ukrainians and to show those Russian generals looking across the border and seeing American flags. I wonder what that means. Biden took that off the table, saying there would be no American forces involved, and he got nothing for it. I think uh, uh, Putin was undoubtedly waiting for a second Trump term, but uh, he's getting effectively almost what he would have expected then. John Bolton was invited on cable news to talk about foreign affairs again, and it got a lot of people asking, why the f does anyone care what John Bolton thinks? The former Bush and Trump administration official who has never seen a war he didn't like was on MSNBC this week to talk about the increasing tensions between Ukraine and Russia. And during this segment, he said more U.S. troops should have been sent to Ukraine earlier. It'll come as no surprise to anybody who's familiar with Bolton's ideology that diplomacy was never a factor in his analysis. If you don't know anything about Bolton, here's a brief primer. Bolton is one of the key architects of the Iraq War. Bolton knowingly lied about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction to get us into that war, a war that resulted in over a million people dying. And despite the mountain of corpses left in the U.S.'s wake in Iraq, he called it a resounding success. Well, I think the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, that military action, was a resounding success. Bolton supported the NATO-led military intervention in Libya, but ousted Muammar Gaddafi and essentially turned that country into an open-air slave market. Bolton has called for preemptive strikes on North Korea and Iran. In the wake of the U.S.'s disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan, Bolton went out into the media and started arguing that we needed to immediately ratchet up tensions with its neighbor, Pakistan. Bolton has supported coups and fascist right-wing leaders around the world. And while Bolton was in the Trump White House, he used his time to remove the U.S. from various arms control treaties and international agreements. And these are just a few examples. But Bolton keeps getting invited back on cable news to talk about these things you have to ask yourself, why? To understand that, you need to consider the relationship the military-industrial complex has with the media. The media loves war. You see it in how the media frames the U.S.'s presence in global affairs. The U.S. military is always framed as noble, just, and good, no matter what they're doing. You see sensationalized animations of different attacks, and even publishing raw footage from the military. Who could forget Brian Williams' orgasm on national TV when Trump bombed Syria? go into greater detail we see these beautiful pictures at night from the decks of these two u.s navy vessels in the eastern mediterranean i am tempted to quote the great leonard cohen i'm guided by the beauty of our weapons um, and they are beautiful pictures of uh, of fearsome armaments making what is for them a brief flight over to this airfield. And when Trump dropped the so-called mother of all bombs, CNN actually spent more time airing test footage of that bomb than Fox News did. They showed this clip 54 minutes during just a six hour segment. And the result of this is really dangerous because it completely sanitizes war, the horrors and the violence of it. They're selling you a product. They're selling you the myth of war. Former war correspondent for the New York Times, Chris Hedges, who was driven out of the Times for his anti-war stance, described this in his book, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. And in it, he describes the myth of war and this valor that we project onto the U.S. military. You see it play out in movies and in video games, where our cause is always noble and just, and whoever's on the other side is reduced to a subhuman level. And this jingoism in our foreign policy makes it easier for us to dismiss any casualties. And as any real reporter who covers war can tell you, even now in Ukraine, the people who are going to feel the burden the heaviest during a time of conflict are the poor, the sick, and the elderly. And I think something that, that people miss a lot in discussions of war is that it, it also doesn't affect people uh, it doesn't affect groups of people and demographics unilaterally. The people who are suffering now along the contact line in Donbass and the people that will disproportionately suffer from any new war are the people that were already the most vulnerable in Ukrainian society um, and in any society that experiences armed conflict. They're going to be the old, they're going to be the poor, the sick, the infirm, the people who for the most part, do not have the means or the ability to leave their homes. And as the U.S. media agitates toward a conflict between Ukraine and Russia, 
all the oligarchs in Ukraine are leaving on private jets. And that's the class who ultimately wants this, the wealthy. Progressive intellectual Rudolf Born wrote during World War I that war is the health of the state. And war is a business now in America. War profiteers are salivating at the prospect of another war. And when you have a cozy corporate media aligned with the military industrial complex, it makes sense that you see way more John Boltons on cable news analyzing this conflict than peace activists. There's no money to be made in advocating for peace and diplomacy. People do it because it's the right thing to do. So next time you see a war criminal on your television talking about how diplomacy has failed in this crisis when it was never meaningfully tried, think critically about why they're there. At the end of the day, we need to fight the rich and not their wars. John Bolton.